Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to another edition of the Rotopros.com Best DFS Show that just happens to come at you around 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six and all the main sites. Welcome to another Champions League breakdown for the knockout stages, second leg of the first set of games for March 5th and 6th, 2019. There's a few things I want to touch on here really quickly before we jump into the slate of games. The first thing I want to touch on is salaries. This slate, the salaries are incredibly high across the board. Not only is every player expensive, but they're too expensive. Uh, all the viable options that you could kind of blindly select uh, from slate to slate are way too expensive to slate. So a lot of cases, you're going to have to either punt very heavily on certain players to get a lot of different high uh, high elite salaries into your cards. Or secondly, uh, you may be looking at either a more balanced lineup or more of a GPP take into your cash lineups, which is uh, the second thing I want to touch on, which is I'm playing very light this slate. I find that as predominantly a cash player, this slate is extremely hard to build for, so I don't really want to overextend myself or try to take too many chances in GPP, which I find there there are some very interesting and excellent GPPs to play this slate, but for the most part, they're very high uh, buy-in. So unless you're really looking to put a lot of money in to try and offset that GPP buy-in, you really shouldn't be looking to play too heavy this slate. And as such, I won't be playing very heavy this slate at all. So I'm, I'm looking to predominantly play as a GPP player player this slate which is very uh, very random for me and the third thing I want to touch on is another kind of a GPP take uh, is this is the first opportunity we're going to get for penalty shots I love penalty shots they're one of my favorite things about soccer as a player I absolutely love taking penalty shots it was one of the real reasons that I was allowed to play so yeah it was a great time I love penalty shots Hopefully we'll get at least one or two opportunities this slate for a real chance at penalty shots. And a one in particular that I'm really hoping a team will win in penalty shots this slate. And I'll be betting a lot of uh, my GPP into that strategy. So we'll get there when we get there. Let's uh, start off right. Uh, first uh, jump into the slate breakdown. Uh, the first game on the slate we have Spurs uh, making the trip from England into Germany to play Dortmund. Second game on the slate we have Ajax making the trip from Holland into to Spain to play Real Madrid. The third game of the slate, we, uh, which is actually tomorrow, uh, again, something I should note, two days uh, isn't always the best time to invest tons of money into a slate. I know PGA is a lot of fun whenever you have the multiple day slates, but uh, it, it can be tough in soccer when there isn't the crazy amount of incredible payouts that make that four day commitment or multi day commitment overly viable. So, another reason you may want to play a little bit lighter in terms terms of cash uh because you can't you can't risk someone not starting on the second day which is something we're going to be running into a lot this slate a lot especially with uh man united so yeah, uh, Man United making the trip from England into uh, Paris to play PSG in France. And the final game, we have Roma taking the trip from Italy into Portugal to play Porto. So yeah, let's uh, start right off here. Spurs jumping into Dortmund. So the big thing for Spurs right now is actually two-faceted. The first thing is that they uh, are playing on basically... 48 hours rest which is really not viable for uh in terms of a trip into germany that's very tough and not a very easy thing to do so that's something that you have to remember and is very important going into this slate uh they did win the first uh, game three nothing so it's pretty crucial that they actually didn't concede an away goal uh which basically makes them kind of up by four goals in a way and uh, if you are unfamiliar with the away goal rule i'll touch on it very quickly if you are just skip ahead here by half a minute or so but basically the away goal rule is that the team uh in tiebreakers uh the team that scores the more goals away uh will win the tiebreaker so basically what that means if you win your first game away 2-1 uh, whenever you go home, that team needs to score one more goal than you. Uh, because if uh, they uh, they only have one home goal, and if they score uh, the the one goal to make the aggregate 2-2 uh, at, at your home field, you're still ahead because you have two away goals and they only have one away goal. So away goals are incredibly valuable. Uh, and it's something that it should play a, a, a fairly important role into your uh, decision-making process this slate. So... Spurs didn't concede an away goal, so they're sitting very pretty uh, making the trip into Germany because if they score once, the game's basically over. Dortmund will need uh, 
practically five goals in order to win a game at that point. And while they will have overtime to achieve that five goals if they get that far, it's still a huge ask. Now, um, to converse that, when we get to Dorman, that's a pretty massive ceiling if they happen to hit that, which is possible. Uh, because Spurs are in a kind of a, a mini free-for-all uh, at the moment. They they haven't won in three straight domestic games. They haven't won uh, a UCL away game uh, since I think it's uh, 2017. Yeah, to, to to versus Dortmund. So it was the last time they played Dortmund. Uh, was the last time they won an away game in the Champions League. Uh, they've lost four straight away games, uh, all competitions. They haven't won in three games pre. The, the, following their fa- their last Champions League game. So that's a way that uh, throughout these games you're going to gauge different teams is that every team has played three or four max games since that last Champions League game. And you can kind of gauge what, what type of form they are in uh, coming into this game quite accurately since everyone's had the same amount of games. And Spurs hasn't won uh, in uh, their three, previ- three previous games coming into this, which all happen to be following uh, the last Champions League game. Uh, they haven't won in four straight away games, all competitions, and they've lost three of their last five games uh, in the English Premier League that have come up against teams that have been ranked in the top eight this season. So they're showing that they're actually not very clutch uh, at this moment of the season on top of struggling against higher competition. Uh, They've only won two of their previous nine Champions League away games. And uh, the one bright spot I should mention that they do have coming in here is that they've never actually lost a game to Dortmund. Actually, they've won every game they've played against Dortmund. Uh, so, yeah, that is something to remember here uh, that they're they're basically not looking very good. But neither is Dortmund, which we'll talk about here in just two seconds. So, yeah, that may be something to, to rely on at the end of the day, is that Spurs simply has never lost to Dortmund, and there's been a few opportunities in both Barnes for teams to get the win. So, yeah, um, Lucas Moore, I think, is someone that I'll be paying attention to this slate. His salary is the only real player from Spurs that I, I'm in any way interested in. Uh, in excuse me, Loris should concede and at the same time not see as many saves or uh, opportunities for saves as a lot of the other guys that are in those low value ranges, uh, especially for cheaper. So I think there is there's going to be a lot of conceding to be had this slate across the board. Most goaltenders should concede. So looking for that really cheap goaltender is the route that I'll be going. To further that, uh, Loris should be seeing less saves than all the other cheap goaltenders. So so there's no real reason to choose him as a value when he doesn't have that floor. Now, uh, in the defense, it, it's tough to know who will start at, in, in this juncture, but um, it, it's most likely going to be uh, Aurier and Davies. Uh, if it drops down to something like Davies, I think 3.9 is really interesting to me. Uh, but uh, it, it's tough to know how Spurs will line up their defenders. And considering they are most likely going to concede, uh, I won't necessarily be too deeply buying into that uh, as a GPP play. And none of them really stand out as having a significant cash floor. Now, that being said, this is something to check back on a little bit later, see who they are starting. If it is Trippier, you could probably get away with it for a little bit of discount, but I'm just not too interested in chasing Spurs defenders this late. I think there's a lot better defensive options than Spurs. Now, the main thing I want to talk about here for... Uh, for Spurs is obviously Harry Kane. Now, uh, it isn't necessarily what you think. Uh, basically, my argument is that Harry Kane makes everyone worse at DFS on Spurs. Across the board, everyone's just worse. Uh, the main reason for this is that when he plays... He is the vocal point for this offense, uh, and he isn't necessarily a DFS transversible or transvertible type of player. A lot of his points don't instantly go into DFS, so he isn't necessarily that dream player that you want to be a vocal point of an offense. Secondly, Spurs become a team that take away a lot of their star power and focus their vocal point through Harry Kane, and he's not a star player. Now, I say that as in he's... He is incredibly hyped, but he isn't a player that can take the ball at half, dribble by five people, and score a goal on his own. He cannot single-handedly score, change games. The, the only way, the only way Harry Kane changes games is on the penalty spot. 
And that's not something to chase for either format. Now, in DFS, the only way, again, only way he finds true success in something like cash would be as if literally every other defense, or excuse me, offensive option on the entire slate crapped out and all the huge salaries did nothing and his low score, his low raw points would carry him. That's the only way he finds success because he becomes a layoff player. He's a layoff, the Spurs become a layoff team where they boot the ball upfield to Kane and he lays it out to someone makes a run looks for a rebound or a through ball that's basically how they play and uh, whether it's someone else laying off to Kane or Kane laying off that's that's generally what happens and uh, a lot of times that ball is coming from Erickson so again he isn't getting a true assist Uh, you're looking at Harry Kane uh, drawing the attention uh, for the movement of field and he doesn't necessarily equate that to DFS success that's that's my argument now to further that he's still way too expensive at 10k uh, he'll need uh, a goal from open play and a penalty shot goal to even hope to compete with anyone in either format from this salary. Uh, there should be guys that are 2K less that have just as good floor and if not better ceiling and opportunity at better ceiling. So yeah, I'm not too interested in Harry Kane. To further that, guys like Son, who was on while Harry Kane wasn't playing, scored in like six of his seven games while Harry Kane was out. And since Harry Kane has come back, he's basically been an absolute dud, uh, barely getting to double digits at all. Uh, so, yeah, without Harry Kane, serviceable player. With Harry Kane in the lineup, uh, uh, completely pointless. So that, again, furthers why I am interested in someone like Luca Moore, Lucas Moore and his salary this slate. I don't only 7.1k basically if you're going to take a chance on spurs you may as well look for that low salary and that's where i'll be looking at with lucas mora now to further this a little bit uh and to kind of widen while i'm not why i'm not really interested in spurs this slate is dortmund at home has been borderline obscene this season uh incredible uh very very hard to beat at home uh actually let me rephrase that they've only lost two times at home all season and neither of those losses have come in the bundesliga one was in the champions league and one was in the uh the the domestic cup league uh or competition for germany so yeah they've uh, much like spurs though uh dortmund has kind of been going through this free fall of their own uh, they haven't won since their previous Champions League game. They're actually now even with Bayern Munich at the top of the table for the Bundesliga. And they're kind of Liverpooling it, if if I can make a direct comparison. Uh, they were leading for most of the season here at certain points, like by unfathomable, uncatchable uh uh, margins and uh, they've lost that all they haven't won in three domestic games uh coming into this and then previous to that three was the champions league game and then even before that they were on a three game winless streak as well uh so the, they've uh i think it's six or seven games now that they haven't won uh straight all competitions and a lot of that has to do with a lot of their guys are coming back from injury uh, so yeah, it, it is uh, to be said that they are getting healthier right now. They still aren't healthy. Uh, guys like uh, Royce and, uh, for example, uh, Polisic, both coming back from long-term injuries. So yeah, Spurs really should be scoring here. So I'm not too interested in Berkey. Uh, but yeah, like I said, they they've never beaten Spurs before. So. Even a draw is kind of a huge ask from that mentality. And from that salary at 5.3K, Dortmund are coming into this game favorites, but they, they really aren't that big of a favorites. And a lot of that has to do with just the, the I, I'm going to say mispricing this slate because it is a mispricing, but it is an aggressive mispricing. So, yeah, it, it's really tough to uh, say 5.3 is viable against Spurs, uh, despite the fact that they're probably going to get a result despite the fact they've never gotten a result, (laughs) if that makes any sense. And having both Hakimi and Guerrero over 6K is super unviable for GPP because you need them to get the the clean sheet. Without a clean sheet, there's no way they are viable unless Guerrero scores multiple goals or Hakimi takes uh, double-digit crosses or uh, mostly from corners. And 
yeah, that that just doesn't seem like a a, an, a viable uh, situation, especially since Hakimi hasn't been playing very much. It probably will be Delisle, and I don't mind it. I really don't mind Delisle this late, but the concept here is that you aren't playing him as a player who's going to go out and get a ceiling. This is your low cash low floor play for the slate. Uh, only 3.8K in DraftKings. He's probably going to get around six fantasy points, which is really all you need this slate from 3.8K because that allows you to really spend up elsewhere. So yeah, I'm not necessarily too interested in uh, Guerrero despite playing as more of a forward, and that would explain his 6.1 price tag. Uh, but yeah, minutes are a concern. Uh, minutes are a concern across the board this slate. Uh, most guys don't play 90 minutes. So, yeah, it, it's tough. Uh, a lot of these teams in this slate don't keep their role players on for full 90 minutes. So we're going to be struggling to find uh, a ton of viable 90-minute players. So I do like Diallo uh, for only 3.8K as a low floor, uh, low salary play. In the middle, Sancho should be getting 90 minutes here. If uh, I, I don't mind him if he gets the start. Uh, Goza is an easy fade. Continue to fade Goza. He doesn't convert really well to DFS. And when I say really well, I say he doesn't convert at all to DFS. He is definitely one of the most active and vocal point players on Dortmund. But as you can see, he doesn't do anything on DraftKings. FanDuel, a little bit different situation, but on DraftKings, uh, easy fade, continue to fade. Royce is coming back from injury. I'm not necessarily sure if he's 90 minutes viable. And again, he's one of those players that without a, a tremendous game, isn't viable. They'll never get to any kind of a floor that the, will be worthwhile from their salary. So, yeah, I'm not really interested in uh, anyone outside of Sancho if he gets the start, and probably that would be just for GPP by itself. And uh, up front, I do like uh, Pablo uh, Paco Alcer at uh, only 7.8k, not necessarily for. Uh, GPP or for cash, excuse me. I would definitely keep for GPP. They tried to uh, rest him over the midweek, but uh, they end up losing. Dortmund lost obviously 2 1 to Arsberg, and they brought him on the field to, to try and catch the game to win the game, and they failed. So, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me to see him get a full 90 minutes to snag a goal this late for only, for, for only 7.8k. That's a really solid GPP play uh, in my eyes. But, uh, yeah, I'm expecting really. Low scoring defensive game here. Basically, Spurs just has to defend and not give up three goals. That's really it. And uh, in doing so, we'll go to overtime. And then uh, if nobody scores in overtime, there will be a penalty shootout. So, yeah, Dortmund do need four goals to win. And that makes them one of the truest ceiling teams of the slate because they do have to go for it. So I don't mind guys like uh, Paco Alcer at only 7.8K. And I also uh, don't mind uh, someone even uh, taking a little bit more risk on maybe a uh, Witzel or a Delaney. Uh, I don't really hate that. Uh, Delaney has known to find his way onto a penalty shot uh, a time or two. So, yeah, uh, that's basically where I would keep my dormant exposure. Just a lot of looking for the low floor, low cat, low salary play. Not a lot to pick from from this game uh, because Harry Kane makes everyone worse. Uh, final score, I'll say uh, two one, uh, two one, maybe three one Dortmund, maybe if we're lucky, but it'll probably be a two two one Dor two one Dortmund final after Spurs scores very early in the game and uh, basically seals it instantly. Next game on the slate, we have Ajax traveling to Real Madrid. A very interesting game here. Uh, basically, unlike most of the teams uh, from Tuesday, Ajax isn't on a losing streak right now. Uh, they've won three straight uh, domestic games. Uh, they the, the big concern, though, obviously, is that they did concede uh, two away goals in the first game. So they need to score two away goals at least this game. We'll get back to that again for true ceiling and not concede more than once. Uh, in doing so, we'll 
draw it to overtime. This is my overtime game. This is the game I believe will make it to overtime and go to penalty shootout. Is that a cash script? No, that's a GPP script, but it's definitely one of my favorite GPP scripts to buy into. And I think this game could hold 120 minutes of solid production, in particular for Ajax. And I want to explain a little bit deeper deeper into that in a second here, but they the, they haven't lost in seven straight Euro games. Uh, so... The, this isn't a team to mess with. Uh, I shouldn't. Now I say a European contest. Obviously, uh, last slate was a, a pretty interesting game. Uh, what my suggestion was for everyone was to take the uh, Onana and roll with that in uh, either format, which really worked out quite well uh, with eight fantasy points. And I know that uh, the two one loss there. This is uh, sorry eight uh, eight straight away. Uh, your, or I should say European contest is in uh, the entire UEFA. But yeah, um, they've scored in uh, 12 of their 13 previous uh, Champions League away games. Uh, but at the same time in those 13 games, uh, 11 of those, both teams have scored. So the big hope again here is that they can keep Real Madrid under at least one goal, which is a really huge ask. Now, the idea, like I said last late, Go with Onana because he shouldn't get blown out. And I'm taking the same step again this slate. And thankfully, he's even uh, gone down in salary. Now, the theory here is that Real Madrid are really set. Uh, I'll touch on it a little bit more quickly uh, or a little bit more lengthily later. But to quickly touch on 100% of the teams in Champions League history in the knockout stages who have won their first game 2-1 away have gone on to, to progress. Uh, a lot of that, again, as I said, has to do with the away goals. And scoring two away goals makes a huge, uh, huge situation for other teams as they basically start the game down to nothing. Uh, now, uh, Ajax does have the opportunity here, especially from some really low salaries. And uh, starting with Onana, I think, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Taglifico, he isn't the worst play from 5.6K, uh, but I definitely uh, much preserve, prefer excuse me, going with uh, Missouri for only 4.9K. Probably one of my favorite cash plays of the slate uh, for defenders. His salary is right. He has an excellent floor, especially when we look at the other salaries and other names on on the slate uh his numbers stack up really well for only 4.9k when basically every other player that has any kind of a floor cost uh at least 1.1k more so yeah i really don't mind uh some masury into your cash cards at only 4.9k uh, and that also chases this a little bit in the random GPP situation where Real Madrid gets shut out one nothing or something to that extent. Uh, you're still making lots of uh, upticks in cash on this. So in, in midfield, it's really tough. Uh, Zayac is viable from 10.9k, but he is so obscenely expensive. Uh, he is an incredible player, uh, incredible role player for Ajax, but at the same time, at most, he's a 9.9, 9.7 kind of salary. So I think he is about one, uh, 1,000 too expensive on DraftKings. Uh, he is going to get double. He, he is a d double digits viable, though. He is going to get a, a really solid chance for double digits, even against Real Madrid. It's just, is there other players for 8K or less that we can get that are double digits that are cash viable? I think there are. So he definitely isn't my favorite cash play. He was last slate, but that isn't where I'll be looking this slate. Uh, now, to further that, uh, it'll be uh, Zayak, Cash, GPP, uh, Ducentatic, uh, and. I'm not really that interested in paying 9.5k for Deuce and Tadic away at Real Madrid. Uh, just a whole bunch stacked against him where he's just not as viable as a bunch of the other names. Especially when uh, we look at last game and that's kind of like a more... Two goals is worth 24 odd points, so that's 1.5. Uh, two goals is worth 24, so we did okay that game. Uh, one goal, one goal is worth 12, so that's like what 3.5 extra. There's 6.5, and assist is worth six points, so that's what again uh, 6.5 random. Uh, so it, that's really just not the kind of fantasy points you're looking to back up a player with a goal or an assist from 9.5k uh in really either format uh so yeah i'm just not that interested in uh Deuce and tatic and up front 
minutes is the huge concern for me. I really do like David Neres from 6.2K. Uh, from that kind of salary range, I, I would even say he's borderline cash viable. He does have a decent enough floor uh, where uh, you, you aren't really losing out here uh, in cash if he finishes with six fantasy points from 6.2K. Now, the big thing for me is that David Neres, along with Casper Dahlberg, are two future world stars. Uh, Ajax is absolutely jam-packed with wonder kids, as they're called, uh, or, or kids that, in, uh, that are under 21 that in a few years will be playing and be uh, on the Man City's, Liverpool's, Bayern Munich's, the biggest teams in the world, and be some of the most highest demanded players in the world. Uh, to run over a few of the names, Matthias Daylight is considered the... The next greatest world defender maybe even the best uh the next best ever world defender uh super wonder kid uh he's captain of all sorts of different teams including Ajax since 19 years old uh just like an absurdly talented young uh young man uh yeah <laughs> It's tough uh, to not look at these names and say that they don't have some sort of ceiling, uh, like Dolberg or, in particular, David Neer as another wonder kid. So, yeah, I, I really don't mind uh, David Neer as for either format. I'd probably keep him to GPP, but, yeah, that's just uh, where you can look. And uh, across the board, generally, outside of Tadic and uh, Zayek, you're looking at a ton of different players who have really solid uh, value options. Shone is another guy I'm considering for cash at 5.8K. He's done more than enough and found his way into some set pieces uh, to have a viable floor uh, for 5.8K. That's the kind of salary I don't mind for cash to slate. So uh, you can get away with David Neres. I would definitely prefer Shone. Uh, hopefully he gets the start here and sees the full 90 minutes and we can use him in either format. But preferably uh, cash for David uh, or for David Neres uh, for uh, La Shone. Uh, so yeah, David Neres, maybe Shone for Ajax and uh, definitely get to Missouri and Onana as uh, two of your better cash options. So it's tough this slate. I'm not necessarily coming out here and saying that Ajax is going to put out a performance or or a team result that is cash viable, but their salaries and roles and floors all match up to make them cash viable this slate. Uh, so yeah, I have no issue with those three, despite the talent and pedigree of Real Madrid. Um, yeah, um, I really do think they're here for the taking this slate. They are the home team, uh, so and they do have uh, uh, the away goal advantage. So as I mentioned, uh, no team has failed to progress after winning the first leg 2-1 away. Uh, they haven't drawn yet this Champions League. So as long as they uh, keep... See, the issue with 2-1 at the same time is that if Ajax happens to score right away, uh, it's a completely different game. Uh, so, yeah, there's something to remember there. Real Madrid has won 42 of their 53 uh, Champions League games. They've won seven straight versus Ajax, and they haven't lost to Ajax since 1995. So they are looking pretty good for uh, at least a win here. Uh, they haven't, uh, however, much like all the other teams that we've talked about on Tuesday uh, so far, they haven't won in five straight since their last Champions League game. Uh, they've only won one of their previous six in all competitions. They've conceded in eight of their nine champ previous nine Champions League games. And in the three games, uh, or I should say, and in three games, uh, straight games versus Ajax, they've conceded. So Ajax are looking good for a goal here, which does make me like uh, the uh, the uh, David Neres play a little bit more. Especially if we can get that at 90 minutes. Uh, or especially, especially if we can get that at 120 um, so a, a couple off DFS predictions to make. I think this is a really interesting sneaky games. Both teams should score. Uh, I actually do need to win this game, <clears throat> excuse me, by more than pl plus 1.5. Uh, ideally, uh, they need a higher score line than 2-1. Um, I think I is the Cinderella story this year. Someone like, uh, 
Huntelar, I think could come. We could see come on uh, in extra time here and either win the game or take a penalty shot to win the game. He's 35 years old. He isn't someone that uh, you should sleep on in terms of just like general interest. If you see him come on the field, don't like get disappointed in Ajax. He's worth a win. He's definitely worth a win in real life. So yeah. Shone, Masri, Onana hopefully gets 120 minutes and a victory uh, in a 2-1 uh, after regulation Ajax win, which will send this to overtime, and they will win uh, in penalties, uh, in 3-1 penalties, I guess you could say. In, or I guess uh, to further that, the aggregate would be 7-6 uh, aggregate. So, yeah. Uh, that is my final score. Two one Ajax overtime penalty shots. Ajax wins. Ajax wins in penalty shots. Next game on the slate, we have Manchester United making the trip into Paris. Uh, very very tough game for Man United here. I'd like to see them win. I'd even like to see them progress. But if there's any team uh, that could reach the injury level of PSG, it's absolutely Man United. So they haven't won a knockout uh, stage game since 2014. It's been a little bit of a dread for them, and there are two away goals in the hole, which uh, as we've talked about previously. They didn't even score a goal. So, yeah, they're way behind the eight ball. They're basically three goals behind right now. Uh, they've lost back-to-back -back Champions League games. Uh, English sides are winless in six straight uh, at PSG. So, this isn't a game where we necessarily can look at any kind of a foundation to, excuse me, build a cash win around. So... My big concern with, P or with uh, Man United is their injuries. David DeGay probably won't see enough saves to offset any amount of goals he let he will let in, which he should. So I'm not necessarily interested in DeGay, uh, whether for cash or GPP. You can get away with Ashley Young at 5.2K for cash. He definitely is my favorite cash play, but he checks all the boxes and uh, is only 5.2K. So I really don't have too many issues with him if you're interested in getting some Man United. Uh, but if there's some place I would be looking for Man United as a whole in either format, it's probably Diego Dalot at only 4K. He's playing as a central midfielder. And in the situation, which I will talk about here in a few moments with PSG, who have the defender playing in the midfield but it costs 2k more we're getting the same kind of discount here on Dala that we can range into uh where we only really need him to get five to eight fantasy points for 4k and we're flying in either format because it's going to allow us to spend up on a lot of different names and get multiple big salaries into a card which is very complicated to do this slate and uh, to further that up front, uh, Rashford at 8.7K is very interesting to me in GPP. Uh, it isn't something I'll be looking to jump on by any means, but it is a viable play. A lot of the issues here for me and the bonuses for me this late is uh, Man United's midfield and how incredibly injured and suspended it is. Pogba won't be playing. He's suspended across the board. Uh, so where I will be looking this late, I think one of the main locks for me this late is Angel Pereira at only 3.4K on Man United. You can really go a lot of different ways here on the midfield options for Man United. You can use some Fred uh, at only, uh, where is he at? At only 4.1k he does work as well it's tough to know who will get the set pieces i do like prayer to take some uh open field crosses at the very least more uh, open field crosses uh than fred and have a better chance at seeing 90 minutes than fred who has consistently subbed off with lots of options or with no options fred finds a way to get off the field uh, I'm a little bit uh, also smitten by the idea of Scott Matamahi. Uh, if he continues continues to play for Matic, he's been uh, super viable for me in cash in the EPL uh, for the past few slates, uh, finishing uh, five to eight fantasy points with ease. From 3.6K, that's all you really need on DraftKings this slate to help you spend up on really big names. So, I necessarily wouldn't hate the idea of two different super value Man United players in either format, uh, midfield options. Uh, 
try to uh, find roots or routes, however you choose to say it, uh, to the big name forwards with the big salaries, uh, which as you can see with just this build that we have right now, we could even spend up on Onana to a more um, expensive winning or keeper uh, and still have lots of room to get uh, two 10K plus salaries and forwards. So yeah, I, I don't hate that idea, but I would prefer one or the other. Probably Pereira as uh, he stands just to, to have the better option of across the board for Man United. Uh, now for PSG, uh, very overpriced, uh, incredibly overpriced. They're probably... I'm not going to sit here and tell you they won't do well because they're probably going to do well. Uh, but at the same time, uh, just because they are uh, deserving doesn't necessarily mean that we should be jumping on this immediately. All this is is that they have a two-goal advantage, and they don't really have to press things too much. They haven't lost at home this Champions League. Uh, French teams have won four of the last five knockout games, uh, knockout round games versus English teams. They've won six straight at home versus English sides. The last time they've lost to an English side was in 2004 to Jose Mourinho's Chelsea. Uh, they've scored 35 goals in their previous 10 Champions League home games. But at the same time, they've conceded in five straight uh, UCL Champions League home games. So uh, this is a both team score kind of scenario, which draws me back to the super value on Man United. You can kind of chase that in GPP as a ceiling play because PSG are most likely going to concede this game despite Man United's mass injuries. Uh, Take a deep breath. Both teams have scored in 10 of the 11 previous Champions League games for Paris Saint-Germain. And uh, Mbappe is tearing things up as the only viable healthy player uh, as a, an attacker for PSG. He's got uh, six goals in uh, six of his seven previous games versus English teams. And he's got seven goals over his previous six games as a whole. And uh, the really the way you want to approach this with all these salaries... It sucks. Danny Alves was like literally 2.7K in nonsense forever, and it was so much fun getting to play him, but that is not a viable option anymore. Uh, 6.5K is just too expensive. You can play it, but is that the best 6-point-whatever defender option this slate? He doesn't play a position that takes tons of crosses. He doesn't take tons of set pieces, so... Yeah, what is he really at the end of the day? And he's just someone who's been playing really well in an off position, which is no longer viable. So, yeah, I'm not as interested. Same can be said with Mounier. Just hasn't been putting up the kind of numbers that you need from someone from that kind of salary. It'd be fun if he was around 5K, uh, not 6.5K. Um, the midfield is basically a simple fade for me across the board. Uh, guys either aren't offensively involved enough or have no floors or are way too expensive. Uh, one guy that I was half considering a GPP is Chupo Moting if he happens to get the start. It'll be interesting to see how PSG do line up, but basically the way you should just approach this is Di Maria Cash, Mbappe GPP. You can get away with Mbappe and GPP, especially if you have the salary, but there's really no foundation floor to roll with where Di Maria has almost exclusive set pieces right. So you're going to want to get Di Maria into your cash cards this late for only 9.7k, getting a guy with his kind of a defined role on a team like PSG for under 10k is definitely something I'm into this slate, uh, basically every slate. Uh, so yeah, neither team are really in a position to do a lot with all their injuries and their suspensions. It wouldn't surprise me to see uh, PSG take it easy and Man United just not have enough in the midfield to capitalize on PSG taking it easy. A lot of this game will be, I expect, PSG to bypass the midfield and attack, kick it up to the forwards, and they'll be laying it off and cutting it back a lot to those super value midfield players like Fred and Pereira. So make sure to get Pereira into either format this late. I think he does have a super viable uh, ceiling. But PSG should really dominate, especially through the midfield and defensive issues of Man United. And all we can really do here is pray for some value starters from PSG and hope they kind of don't take this as seriously, despite the fact they're like seven wins uh, clear of the uh, first place in uh, the uh, P in the uh, Paris, or I shouldn't say Paris, excuse me, the French Premier League, uh, League One. So yeah, uh, 
Final score, I'm going to say another 2-0 PSG win. I think they're going to score first uh, really, uh, or excuse me, a 2-1 PSG win. Uh, they're going to score first and kind of go into cruise control for the rest of the game. Maybe score again. Uh, probably 1-1 one, one draw, something like that. But Man United should score. It'll probably be late in a reply out of desperation. And I'm hoping it will be a one of those value midfielder starters who will have a really decent floor as is. So, yeah, it's tough. I don't see Man United winning, but at the same time, I don't see them get shut out. Let's say a 2-1, two, two, one, a 1-1 one, one draw, 2-1 PSG win. Final game of the slate, we have Roma making the trip into Porto. Uh, very interesting game once more. Uh, Roma... Free fall, kind of like the Spurs, Dortmund. They're in really bad shape at the moment. Uh, they've conceded six goals over their three previous uh, domestic league games. They've lost seven straight Champions League away games. They haven't won away in the Champions League since uh, 2008. They've won only three of their past ten domestic games this season, uh, conceding 13 goals over their five previous five away games. Uh, so this isn't a team that we should be basically looking to dominate away from home, especially from these salaries, which in many cases do demand uh, dominance. So we can fade the goalkeepers for lack of ceiling and lack of serious floor, especially when we consider the likes of Nana and the other low value options. Uh, the lower they go, it seems, the slate and keeper for salary, the more saves they're seeing. Uh, it doesn't always necessitate necessitate to the more goals uh, that they will see so yeah uh, I'm not interested there collar off is too expensive if you're, if you're looking to get some Roma exposure this slate uh, I'll be looking at Florenzi at only 4.2k I think he makes a ton of sense and kind of opens you up to the ability to take any goalkeeper you want so yeah I really don't mind uh, Florenzi as a defensive option for cash for only 4.2k he really should be seeing 90 minutes another name that you're definitely going to want to explore this slate for cash is uh, Luca Pellegr Lorenzo sorry not Luca Lorenzo L Luca's the other one uh, Lorenzo Pellegrini for 8.4k. Uh, he's been an absolute crossing machine. This Champions League has a really solid floor. And for someone that's under 9k, we're getting double digits. Where most of the guys that get double digits this late, we're looking at 10k or more. So that's definitely someone you're going to want to get into your cash slates. Starters. The issue with starters this slate for Roma. It could be very confusing to know who they're going to start. Dzeko should start. Is always GPP viable. He leads the Champions League in uh, chances created. Uh, not necessarily goals though. So yeah, he is viable. Under should be out. So we're looking at uh, potentially uh, Zanillo getting the start again. But if he's out, then we should be looking at someone like uh, either Justin Clivert who is interesting or... Or uh, Patrick, uh, or excuse me, uh, Patrick uh, Schick uh, for only 6.1K, who I don't mind for GPP. is kind of a, the same idea as Zanillo last slate. Uh, he definitely is very far down my list. Most of the Roma attackers are outside of Jekyll for GPP. If I'm playing anywhere in uh, in anywhere for Roma this slate, it will be Florenzi as the defender and uh, Pellegrini here as a midfield option for only 8.4k in cash. So yeah, for Porto, uh, very interesting how we can look at this. Uh, they did score an away goal, and they've conceded very rarely in this Champions League, actually, in only one of their four uh, home games. So yeah, they've lost only one of their previous 16 domestic home games. They are coming into this in a fair bit of form. And uh, Moraga is someone I'm really interested in to say because he scored in every single home game along with basically every game this uh, Champions League. So, yeah, I, I'm definitely interested in some Moraga. He's been printing money. Uh, all five uh, previous Champions League games uh, for Porto have had at least three total goals. So, again, we're looking at a serious chance for production this late from guys that don't cost 10K. Uh, now... At the back, you can consider Casillas at only 5.2k. I'd probably keep him to GPP because his floor is not is pretty good, but his salary is just a little bit too expensive compared to those lower, uh, below 4k guys, 4k or lower, who should come to that exact same floor but not have the same kind of ceiling as uh, Casillas. So I do like the potential for Casillas to get a clean sheet this slate. Uh, Telus is another one of those cash guys that you have to consider. Now, 
Uh, I do like him more than most other cash options for a couple reasons. And firstly, he gets upfield a lot more than most of the other defenders. And secondly, he takes the penalty shots along with most of the set pieces. So, yeah, if uh, there's a penalty shot, Tellis will be taking it. And I have absolutely no issue with him in cash this slate at 6.1K as my guy who I will be spending up for in terms of all the expensive salaries on defender. And we'll take a, a really quick look at that here. You see what I mean? Like, like Danny Alves, um, not necessarily uh, interested in that. Uh, ch -ch See, um, Roma has a lot of their players listed out, and they're not out. It's because of the last DraftKings slate that they featured in, which was a domestic game, which they are or were suspended for. They were out. So, yeah, uh, you can see what I mean here with the expensive salaries. Like Danny Alves playing the midfielder player. Uh, it was fun when he was below 3K, not necessarily anymore. So, yeah, I do like uh, I do like Tellez as my favorite out of all these super expensive. Carvals, a very close second, though, at 6K. Uh, so yeah, that that's definitely where I would take uh, Tellez. Now let's jump back over to Porto in the midfield. Uh, basically, you can either take the time or take my word. The big issue for Porto and always has been for Porto for multiple seasons is their minutes. Let's see if Barami got ninety minutes. No, exactly. Like this is their cash guy. This is the guy if you're wanting to play cash for Porto. Uh, and from a midfielder, it's Barami, and he rarely sees enough minutes. And across the board, nobody sees minutes. Like, nine more than 9K for a guy, yes, he's got double digits in three straight games, I'll give him that. He's also not played more than 80 minutes yet. So, yeah, there's just no reason to pay that much money for someone you're risking. You're risking a lot in GPP, and that's not... Uh, a very good, that's what, barely two times salary at uh, at GPP from that salary. So, yeah, there's no reason to do that 9K. Um, and, yeah, Herrera is always uh, good on FanDuel, not so much on DraftKings, just doesn't convert his skill set. And as I was mentioning, uh, Moraga has scored like a monster just nonstop, especially at home. So I really, I don't dislike him for GPP. Uh, but yeah, uh, Akbar should be coming back here eventually. I'm looking forward to it. He uh, was scoring at the same Moraga rate last season, so he is that kind of player. So there isn't too much left here to really discuss. Uh, the final game, I like it to be probably a 2 nothing Porto win. Uh, maybe a 3-2 Porto win, something crazy. But uh, yeah, I don't see Porto losing this. Uh, they're just too good at home. And Roma, not only are they bad away, but they're coming into this incredibly bad form. And just not a lot of viable options. So yeah, let's, uh, let's say Porto win and Roma will still score. So yeah, that is the four-game slate. So remember, it's over two games. I recommend playing lightly this slate because it is so salary-heavy that there aren't a lot of different viable cash options, though I do like what I have presented here for everyone. Uh, yeah, rotapros.com. Get over, check us out, sign up for our Slack, join the community. Uh, top right hand, articles, drop down, free content. Uh, there'll be lots of different stuff there. Uh, hit me up on Twitter, Rad Rob Diamond. Find me on message boards or the sites, uh, Sir Robert Six. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Best of luck on this Champions League knockout stage, uh, finishing up uh, the second leg. So thank you very much, everyone. Take care. Best of luck.